Morning guys, how are you today? It is going to be a hot one down here. Let me tell you, they're saying 32 up to 36 degrees today, which is going to be hot, hot, hot. I don't like heat, so this is the perfect place for me. I'm in a nice cool studio, nice crisp and cool down here. Great comfort to work in. So we're gonna have some fun today and try to stay cool by painting a snowman. So he's um, a fun little guy. The snow day piece is a lot of fun to paint, so we're gonna have fun with him. But before we get to that, we gotta cover a couple of things. We have winners from last week's giveaway, uh, the brush, uh, black gold brush set. And I know I'm gonna say this wrong, Patty, so I'll apologize in advance <laughs> to Patty Piatek or Piatek. I'm not sure which, but I apologize if I got it wrong. And uh, you've got that gorgeous set of black gold brushes. The One of the encaustic sets went to Laura Rollo Haberstrow and the other went to Rawlene Hutchinson. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me here on Saturdays. It's really nice to have you. And this keeps me as sane as it keeps the rest of you. So, which uh, my family would probably say is questionable. So <laughs> we do have some great new giveaways uh, for this week. Um, we have some brush sets. We have a couple of stencil sets and we have a really fun giveaway. Um, we're playing with an idea for some shirts. So we have an a really cool giveaway. One of you is going to win this really neat craftgasm shirt. I love this. I have this sign hanging in my in my studio, craftgasm. Um, I think you'll get a kick out of it. So uh, one of you is going to win that t-shirt. We have a gorgeous set of my faux squirrel brushes. It has two riggers in it, a number two and a number zero. It has a number eight filbert wave and it has a really awesome pair of my favorite angle brushes. So one of you is gonna get that gorgeous set. And then we have two of the Snow Day stencil sets to give away as well. So lots of fun stuff uh, coming up for this week. Um, the YouTube channel. So every time we film a live, it gets posted on my YouTube channel as, and the link goes up on my website. Um, if you hit the subscribe button on my YouTube channel, then you'll be notified every time there's a new video goes up because they're not always just the lives. We do other videos as well. So you'll get notifications when those pop up. So hit that subscribe button and join me every day for all sorts of fun things. Um, and the lives are moving. We're moving to a new Facebook page called Tracy Moreau Live. Um, so it, obviously if you don't follow the page, uh, go there, like the page. Uh, there'll be uh, free patterns posted on that page. There'll be lives posted on that page, links to new videos, links to new patterns, um, links to special deals on the website, etc. But if you're going to join us every Saturday, that's the place to watch it. So you'll be joining us on Tracy Moreau Live. Go check out that Facebook page. Okay. I think I've covered all the news of the day. I'm beginning to feel like one of those guys on CNN. So let's go back to uh, why we joined here today. And that is to paint this great little snowman. He is so cute. How can you not love a snowman? He's so cute. This little fella already has a home. He's going to be shipped out west. He's going out to British Columbia to keep my, my pal Deb company. So Deb, you keep an eye out for him. He'll arrive in your mailbox in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Okay, gang, so let's flip the camera down and we'll get started. So, a first thing we're going to do is base coat this surface. You see I've got this one is all black. And I, again, we're going to use that, um, that same base that I use for a number of different things. And that is using that fugly brush that I keep talking about. This is my fugly brush. Um, I had a conversation with Veronica at Dynasty Brush the other day, and she said um, we really need to do something about that. So I have a new fugly brush. <laughs> She's sending me a new one. So uh, of course I don't have one here. So this this fellow is the one that's getting all the work out today, and he is fugly, but he has seen a lot of love. So get him wet. We're going to start with a little warm white, and. It's simple. This is the, the same idea as what I use for my barn board. You get a little water into that warm white paint. So it's a little thin. Now I want the lines in this one running vertically. So I'm going to apply this vertically. I don't want to bury that black completely. I want to see 
some of that texture in there. That's Stria. It just makes for an interesting background and it creates a lot of visual depth. So when you start lay layering colors in, uh, this creates some interesting patterns and visual textures in the background. And it's really easy to do. Just keep them running vertically in this case. And again, neatness doesn't really count with this one. You know, the more texture you have back there, the better. But you do need to have a fair amount of white on this surface. So I'm going to say probably, probably about 90% of this surface is going to be white. And then the rest of it is going to have that little bits of black showing through. And you can make it as bright as you like. And you can do a little bit, little extra bits with a layer of white. It just gives you more texture, more pattern, and more depth. So, easy peasy, right? This is not super difficult to do. I'm going to make a little bit of noise here and hit the surface with the hair dryer just to quickly dry this. It doesn't take very long, it only takes a minute. Almost there. There we go. We're good to go. Now, uh, the background in this fellow is fairly subtle. Let's bring this in here so you can see. The background in this is fairly subtle, but there's actually a lot going on back there. We have um, a snowflake stamp in the background, and it is rather hit and miss. I don't really like to see them too perfect. So I'm using the stencil or stamp, pardon me, the stamp I'm using, this one is from Stampendous. This is one of their cling stamps. It's CRR234 is the item number on it. This one is called Snowflake Sky. This one is pretty neat. It's a fairly distressed looking stamp to start with, so the finish is going to be fairly distressed as well. So some are gonna be really, really clear. Others are gonna be a little more subtle, which is exactly what I want. So I'm going to flip that over and you can do this two ways. I'm going to do it with a stamp pad this time, um, but you can do it with a brayer and a little bit of black paint too. So with the stamp pad, I just you know, rub it on, press it on. I'm using a stays on because this one is not bothered by acrylic paint and it's not bothered by the water either once they're completely dry. So I'll load up that stamp and I'm going to press that into place, just like that. Again, I don't worry about getting it utterly perfect. And I'm gonna line this up at the bottom because there's still a little bit of ink on this. And there we go. So I'm going to continue until this whole surface has a stamped image on it. and just fill up the space. I'm not worried about getting things utterly perfect. It's just creating a little background texture. And it is going to look a little busy, but that's okay. Busy's okay. There's a lot of stuff going on with this. So if you get it and it's a little smudged or a little smushed or it's not perfect, it's not clear, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. This is just a little background interest. That's all it is. Perfection is to be avoided at all costs. And a little stamp, there we go. Oops, see what I mean? I smudged it a little bit there, that's okay. You've got a snowman and a scarf going there. So if there's something you don't like, you can move the design around to suit you. So that's it, that's as difficult as that gets. So now we have all of this um, snowflake impressions and they're subtle they're not in your face they're not over the top there but they're there so we're going to give this a second to dry that's one nice thing this stays on dries very quickly and then we're going to move on to stenciling 
Now, the stencil sets that we're giving away today are these. So in this stencil set is a 1 8 polka dot, a 3 8 polka dot, the snowflake stencil, and a quarter inch check. Now, uh, when I wrote the pattern, I wrote it so that you could use either or, the checks or the polka dots on the hat. That's entirely up to you, but the stencil is in there. So that's what I'm going to use today. So I have a 3 8 which is a larger polka dot. I have the quarter inch check. I have a 1 8 check and I have a snowflake stencil. So those are what we're going to use to create this background. So let's start with that 1 8. The 1 8 is the smaller of, of the stencils. It's got a really tiny little dot. And I'm going to use my Dynasty Stencil Pro stencil brush. If you haven't used one of these, they're phenomenal. Absolutely love them. They're a synthetic and they work beautifully. You don't need to have a lot of paint. Load it up, swirl it on the palette, quick burnish on the uh, paper towel or the shop towels, and then circular fashion, change directions frequently, and just kind of random, and lift it up, and you see it just creates a tiny bit of pattern back there, just a tiny bit. Uh, guys, we ran into a little technical glitch, so give us 30 seconds. We're going to be right back. We're just going to hit pause for a second. Okay, guys, we're back. You probably noticed we were upside down. <laughs> we were going great guns, but now we're, I think we're right around, right, right way around now. <laughs> okay, so we'll just continue with this. You know, not everything is perfect. So I'm just going to add a few little polka dots in here, like so. And it, it changes the texture in the background. So I do just a little bit in here because we're going to start putting some color on. And I don't want to have all of the polka dots exactly perfectly white, so we're just going to go with a little bit of white first and then we're going to add some color. So we're going to start with a cobalt teal hue, which is that yummy turquoise color in the fluid acrylic, and primary cyan, have a little of that on the palette. And then cobalt teal hue. I love this color. It's so rich. So we're going to use those three colors to develop this background. So this is what's called a monochromatic color scheme. So we're going to use, where's my favorite? I want to use one of those. Angle brush. And we'll start with a little of that cobalt teal hue. Now, I always keep in mind where the main portion or the focal point of the piece is going to be before I start adding color. And I kind of keep that in mind. I don't want it to be too light in and around him, and I don't want it to be too dark in and around him. So I'm going to pull a little of that cobalt teal hue right here. Now, you can thin this with a little bit of water or you can use the Joe Sonia's Fast Drying Glaze. Either one will work. If you don't have or don't have access to the fluid acrylics, 
uh, there is in the pattern a list of colors that you can use in lieu of. So I'm going to put a little of that cobalt teal here and I'm going to carry that color here so it directs the eye from one place to another. So I'm going to pop a little of that into the corner. And always remember that if the color isn't strong enough for you, you can always put more on. You don't have to live with, if the color is looking a little peaky, uh, just let it dry and then put another layer on. This color is transparent, so you can layer, layer, layer until you get where you want to be. Gives you great control. So a loose little slip slap wash of color. Don't worry about getting them utterly perfect. Uh, where else? And let's put a little bit over here. Rule of thirds, do things in threes. It helps keep things nicely balanced. And let's walk a little of that out. There we go. So once we have that in there, now we're going to switch to the, the mid value of these blues, which is that primary cyan. It's gorgeous, I love this color. It's very bright, it's very cool. It is a cold, crisp blue. And I'm going to work it until it starts to meld and blend with the cobalt teal hue. A little bit of water in the brush there wouldn't go amiss. There we go. Pretty, pretty, very pretty cold blue. And I'm going to pull a little bit of that down here. I whoopsied and got it all over the tabletop. There we go. So when I'm working with fluid acrylic, you'll always hear me talking about layers. When you layer colors one on top of the other, they are influenced, their end result is influenced by the color they went over. So when you're talking about a monochromatic, especially in transparent color, and you're putting these brilliant blues with this lovely teal, it does change the color, how, no matter how subtly, does change the color a little bit. So when you're choosing colors, you have to take a little bit of care. Oh, where else? Oh, let's put a little pop of that in here. It doesn't have to be a lot, but just a little. Now we have the darkest value or the, the deepest blue on our color palette is this cobalt teal or this cobalt blue. It's a gorgeous, deep, rich, 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 rich blue. And we're going to pop that into this to finish out this color scheme. I love this dark color and it is really dark and cool and clean and it really works well with all of these other blues. See again that transparent thing when they wash over top they are influenced by the color underneath. So your end result is going to be a direct result of how these two colors work together. Pretty, pretty. Love it. And because it's such a strong blue, look, you can be as heavy handed with this as you like. If you like the blues more intense, then by all means, go a little heavier, go a little stronger. It's not, you can't really go wrong with this. Gorgeous blues. A little more water. I want some more of this cobalt teal. I love this blue. I'm just going to work them in until this space is filled up. How fun is that? Let's pull a little of that dark blue down here. That cobalt teal and this dark blue remind me of icebergs. When you see them in National Geographic, you see those gorgeous blues in the deep dark colors in the icebergs and that's what this reminds me of. It's very cold and icy looking and it just it's perfect for a winter piece. Pretty pretty. 
All right, let's pull a little more in here just to fill up any little holes. You can do that with whichever one of the blues suits you. Once you like the, the teal more than the darker blues, then get a little more heavy handed with the teal. If you like the, the primary cyan more, go for it. Put more primary cyan in. Your own personal taste will, will drive how this looks. And I love cobalt teal. That is, I think, perhaps my favorite color. Favorite blue, anyway. There we go, look at that. Coming along nicely. I like these colors. They're, they marry very nicely together, even though they are very different when you see them individually. The colors are very, very, very different. But then they marry very well in something like this when you start blending these colors together. It gives you a nice base for this piece. So we've got, you can see the polka dots didn't go away, they just changed color slightly. So it gave us a bright spots in that background, which gave us another layer of depth. So we're going to take that same 1 8 stencil again, and I'm going to pick up a little warm white with the stencil brush, and I'm going to stencil a few more of these tiny little polka dots. Uh, again, I don't want them too perfect or too regimented. I would prefer to keep them fairly loose. So there we've got polka dots, and I'm gonna pull a few over on this side, over here, like so, just like that, yay! And now, I'm going to switch over to the 3 8 which is the larger of the polka dots. And we're going to put a few of those in place. I love these polka dots. I have a thing for polka dots anyway. You might notice I'm sounding a little congested. Um, it's that time of year for me uh, between allergies and um, I don't think it's a cold. I think it really do think it's just an allergy, but I've been stuffed up like this for about two weeks. Just as long as I don't start sounding like Gravel Gertie, I'll be happy. There we go. So neatness doesn't count. Perfection is to be avoided at all costs. I'm not looking for fully opaque polka dots. I just want that change. Ooh, those are fun. And let's come up here. So essentially these polka dots are going to mimic snowflakes. So we don't want them to be too perfect or everywhere. There we go. Ooh, fun. Now I do have a quarter inch uh, polka dot that's also fun to use. And you can, they're further spaced so you can, you know, have a little fun with those too. Pop a couple in. It's just for, for texture. Oops. I whoopsied. So there we go. Nice. Oh, what would you mix your Americana paints with to make it more fluid? Glazing medium or flow medium? Either one. Glazing medium has a tendency to get a little bit sticky. Uh, so I don't really like the sticky or the tacky. I like it to move very smoothly. I will lean towards the Joe Sonia's fast drying glaze because it's more like water. It flows more like water. Uh, but flow medium will work too, but use it very sparingly. Okay, so I think we're getting there. So I've got my, um, my polka dots in. The only thing we're missing is some snowflakes like some real snowflakes. So, and I just whoopsied, I made a boo-boo uh, here. I cleaned my stencil brush with water, so now it's wet and I have to go get a clean stencil brush. So, uh, I'm gonna give you a tip that if you're not, there, got a clean, dry one. Um, if you're working with a stencil brush and you want to clean it, but you have to keep it dry, so the, the, for the next thing, um, try a little rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer. They will clean the 
the paint out of your brush, but it, the alcohol will evaporate and then your brush will remain dry so you can continue to work. And it does, it takes out paint really well. A little bit of rubbing alcohol does wonders. So I've got a snowflake stencil here. I want to put just a few in here and I don't want them to be too bright. So I'm going to pop this up and I'm going to go back to that warm white. And I'm going to take almost all of the paint out of my brush, just burnishing it on, a, on some paper towel. And I'm going to very lightly scuff some paint over this snowflake stencil. What I want is subtle. Can you see that? I don't want them to be too, too bright, but I want them there. If they were fully opaque, they'd be too much. So you see, they're very subtle in that background. And so yeah, I've got a few here and I think I'll pop another couple over here. Just a tiny bit of paint. Oopsie. Just like that. Subtle and imperfect. Ah, Rosita, there aren't any fluid acrylics in your country, just Decorate Americana. Can I replace them by using pouring medium? Um, no, the pouring medium actually controls the flow, but it doesn't change the opacity of the color. You, what you want is something to make them a little more transparent. So a clear uh, flow medium or um, even a faux glaze will work. Uh, but I always recommend using like something that is the consistency of water. Um, if you're really in a bind, um, even just water will work. Just remember that the paint isn't going to adhere quite as well as it normally would. So a little bit of water will do the trick too if you can't get any of those specialty mediums. Um, most glazing mediums, faux glaze, um, those things will tend to make the paint a little bit sticky as it dries and it doesn't really change the transparency all that much. A glaze medium will, but then you have also have the issue of drying time. It doesn't dry as quickly either, so uh, even just water will work just fine. Okay, so we have our stenciling in place. We have our very light snowflakes in place. It's really starting to take shape. You can see how that, that background has built up. So now I want to add a bit of an edge to this. I need to um, subdue some of these edges and give them a little bit of color at the same time. I don't want this to look completely icy, so I'm going to float the edges of my board with a little bit of asphaltum. And one of the things you're going to notice almost immediately when you hit these blues with the asphaltum is that that edge takes on a little bit of a green tone. Just a little. The reason for that is that the asphaltum is more of a yellow than a brown. And so brown, or blue blue and yellow will give you green and so we get this subtle green cast along the edges just like that and you'll notice that I'm using a very high-tech method of floating <laughs> not so much it is a side load but the brush has got a ton of water in it so I'm just keeping the dark value to the outside edge and just brushing that color so that it's very transparent. There we go. Okay. So we are ready to trace and transfer that pattern on. So let's talk about that. Okay. So here I have a board already prepped and we're going to talk about um, tracing and transferring. Now for this I use a white graphite and I know you guys have traced and transferred for years and I'm probably not telling you anything, anything new but I do have a couple of little tips so that might be helpful. Um, when I, First of all I tape my line drawing in place 
and then put my graphite underneath it. Make sure you check for the shiny side down so that you don't do what I did yesterday and trace the whole thing onto the back of your paper. So um, once I have my line drawing in place and my graphite in place, I take a little piece of painter's tape and I secure the line drawing top and bottom. So that way it's not shifting at all. There's nothing worse than having your line drawing shift while you're tracing and then your lettering is crooked or lines don't meet up or certain details get missed. Um, that's frustrating. So we have lettering to trace and we have this, this great little guy. I don't use a stylus when I'm tracing. I use a very fine pointed pen. And the reason for this is one, I can see where I've been and two, the trace and transfer lines tend to be very fine. If I use a stylus, I find that I lose a lot of the detail because the stylus is a little thicker. Uh, Debbie Reader, is there a conversion for regular acrylics to fluid acrylics? No, there is not. Um, and the difference is, is because you were literally comparing apples to oranges. Um, Americana acrylics, regular acrylics have very high opacity. They have a lot of um, flattening agents in them. They have a lot of uh, other uh, ingredients in them that make them fairly opaque. So the best we can do is give you a close enough when it comes to uh, finding a substitution for certain colors. We can give you a close enough, but it is almost impossible to give you a, a perfect conversion. So. Uh, un unless we get into mixing color and using transparent glazes and mediums with it. Um, so you're better off just to find the color that is close enough and then use it in thin washes for techniques like this. Um, to get a, a good, solid, perfect conversion is almost impossible. So anytime I'm doing something with the fluid acrylics, we're going forward, we're going to try and give you a list of of good substitution so that you're able to do the project with what you have on hand. Okay, so again, tracing, I use firm pressure but not hard, and I use my black gel pen. Um, one, I can see where I've been, and two, I get a very fine transfer. So let me show you. See how fine that is? So you can get that really fine detail in if you need it but it also, you don't lose detail. So nice sharp point pen, a good quality ballpoint pen with a nice fine tip will work just fine. But because I use these for everything under the sun anyway, I figure I might as well use them for tracing. So firm pressure, white graphite on that. So let's talk about uh, tracing and transferring lettering. I know a lot of you already know this, but I'm going to repeat myself anyway. <laughs> um, this is a six inch steel, stainless steel ruler. It has a cork back. I use these when I'm tracing lettering for a couple of good reasons. Um, verticals and horizontal lines on lettering have to be straight. If they're not straight, then the lettering does not look good. The human eye is conditioned, we are conditioned from birth to read everything from top to bottom, left to right. And so we instinctively notice when things are not straight. And it drives you crazy. Seeing things that are not straight, it's like walking into a house where all the paintings on the walls are crooked. The first thing you want to do is go straighten them. At least I do, because I can't stand it. It drives me crazy. And then all of those little curly cues, those curved edges, those can be freehanded. Because the curves, when they're not perfectly straight, it doesn't, it doesn't catch the eye. Those little curves, you can be forgiven. But the vertical and horizontal lines, if they are not straight, it will ruin your lettering. It looks funky and you cannot paint straight, clean lettering without a straight, clean line. So if you're going to do lettering, if it's got curves, no problem. But wherever there is a straight line, the vertical backs and fronts of these letters, make sure that they're all nice and straight. So that when it's all traced and transferred, let me see if I can 
get this off now. You get nice, straight, vertical, and horizontal lines every single time. So once he's traced and transferred, then uh, one of the first things I do is the shading around the image. So in this case, we're using Eschfaltum and an angled shader. And I go around the whole image with a float, just like we did with the outside edge. I use a float of that Eschfaltum all the way around. And this will give us that nice depth. It'll pop the snowman forward and force the background backward. So nice float around that. And then you're going to go to your lettering. I like to do this before I start painting my lettering because if there's any little wobbles or goofs, instead of me trying to cover it up with white paint, I can cover up the wobbles and goofs with my base coat on my lettering. And so you get a nice clean finish. And this also pops the lettering for it. And although it looks fairly, um, fairly strong now, it will actually look a lot more subtle once the lettering is painted. So all of that shading around the snowman and on the, around the lettering is done next. So the base coats on this little fellow are um, shoreline blue. I love this color, it's really pretty. This is Shoreline. If you're looking for the item number, it is DA365. So this is Shoreline Blue. It's really pretty sky blue with a touch of turquoise. It's a nice color, really nice color. So that is your base color for the hat and the scarf. And then the face of the snowman is done with a little bit of warm white. And I did that with a, a filbert. I can't find my filbert. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. So I've got my filbert. Now, when I'm putting in this warm white, I just dab the color in. I don't, um, it's not painted in solid. The reason for this is that I'm creating a little bit of surface texture. So the, the paint is sort of being stippled on, kind of, sort of. And so it creates a little bit of surface texture and it makes the snowman look a little more soft instead of just being painted a flat white and a solid smooth base coat. So we get that little texture. So at times you're even going to see some of that background peeking through and that's okay. In the end, it is going to look great. So just pity pat that color in and you're going to do the same here Peasy. Usually it takes about two to three coats to get nice, really nice coverage, but it doesn't have to be perfectly opaque. As long as we get a good white base on there, that's all that really matters. And you can see that this is not an absolutely perfect base coat. There's little bits of the background showing through. And I, I rather like that. I find that it just gives him a little bit of texture and a little more interest. And in the end, you'll never notice it anyway. So now we have to start shading this little guy. He's still a little bit wet. So we'll work on his hat. Now I'm going to shade the shoreline blue with um, cobalt teal hue. But before we do that, we have to give him his hat a little bit of texture. So I'm going to use the quarter inch check for his hat. I used the 3 8 polka dot in the original, uh, but I think this time around I'm going to use the check because it's just really cute. So um, then comes the choice. You could either, you could stencil this with any one of the blues that's in the background, um, but I kind of like him looking lighter than the background, so I wanted to pull him really forward, so I used the white instead. So I'm going to load my stencil brush with warm white. Now, here's a tip. I talked about this the other day uh, when we were painting the orchids. This is a really quick tip. 
I'm going to show you something. <laughs> this is really fun. Um, here we have the line drawing for a little snowman. So I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to punch a hole in my snowman's hat. And I'm going to cut out his hat out of the paper, just like this. And you're probably wondering, what the heck is she doing? Um, some of you, I've done it myself, don't want to get the paint onto anything but the hat. Now, in this case, because I'm using white, it's really not that big a deal, but if I wanted to use blue, a dark blue, um, I don't want to get a dark blue all over his white face. So what I do is I take my line drawing I cut out the shape of the hat and I place it over the image like this, tape it in place so it stays put, and then I take my stencil and I tape that in place like so, so it doesn't move. And now I'm going to take my warm white and I'm going to stencil right over top of this just like that now this is handy when you're doing especially little small things I mean, if you do a little thinking ahead about how you have to do things um, then just cut out the shape of the hat or cut out the shape of whatever it is you're stenciling remove the stencil and then you can remove the line drawing as well and that way you don't have to remove paint from the face or the background. It's already in place. <laughs> Somebody's got a question. We're just trying to locate it. That's, uh, what color did you use with the stencil? Uh, with the stencil, I used warm white. Uh, you can also use any one of the blues that we used in the background on that bag. So if he used it in the background, there's nothing wrong with using it on the hat as well. So that's just a simple little tip to mask off the areas. You can do the same thing with the scarf. Uh, I'm just going to wing it on this one. I've winged it before. I'm pretty sure I can manage this time around. So I'll just quickly... I'll just be very careful and avoid the section there we go because I'm using white it's not really all that a big deal if I get it on his face but um, I did not I did want to avoid getting it on the background oh um, Michelle you wanted to know where you could get the supplies used for this project the stencils patterns and the surface great question uh, the pattern and the stencils are available on my website at tracymoreau.net um, the the surface itself is available from Cupboard Distributing, and their website is www.cdwood.com. Um, it's a very inexpensive surface, and, and CD Wood is fantastic. They have some really great and very creative surfaces, and they're affordable. And their service is fantastic, so you'll be very happy with them. So there we go. We've got a stencil in place. So he's got a checkerboard hat this time around, not the polka dots, but you can choose whatever pattern you want. If you wanted to put stars or snowflakes or whatever, it'll work, it'll be fine. So we're going to shade this hat just as soon as, yeah, the paint's dry, dry enough anyway. Now I'm going to pull a little of that cobalt teal hue and float. That's what I'm going to use to shade my scarf. So. I've got this, just like that. Now, this is very loose. There's no need to get too worked up about, you know, having perfect floats. It's very, very loose. Just relax and have some fun with it. So the cobalt teal is shaded under the chin. It's also shaded here, that, you know, that little fold in the scarf. 
that. The nice thing about working with these fluid acrylics for this type of thing is that these colors are transparent. And so you can layer and layer and layer until you get the depth that you want. And those, that depth is gorgeous. So nice little float there. And look how pretty that color is. And we're going to do the same thing to his toque. I am Canadian, it's not a hat, it's a toque. And these, these fluid acrylics float beautifully. Look at that. Gorgeous colors. They're very forgiving. As I said, you can make little goofs, little mistakes, and it's easy to fix them because these colors are transparent. If the float's not strong enough, just simply put another float in. Look how pretty. And that cobalt teal looks so nice over that shoreline blue. So that's what you do. You just continue to float gorgeous thin floats of that cobalt over top of that shoreline. And it gives you a great little hat. Little toque. water my brush here. There we go. I like that you can have so much control when you're working with these paints. You see how that shadow gets a little darker with every float. So once I'm happy I stop. That simple. So his face, we don't want him to look too warm and cuddly. He needs to look cool and collected. We're going to shade him with that same cobalt teal. So he's going to get all of that shading with that same blue. So you shade along the bottom of his face. and into that corner there. And I like this little spot here. Shade right over his eyeballs to give you that little bridge, just like that. And the same around his, his wonderful nose. His nose is based with that wonderful flame, orange flame it's called. It's a really rich, gorgeous orange. And then the same thing around the little chunks of coal in his mouth. Put a little float on the right side of those. Just like that. And again, don't worry about getting them utterly perfect. Let's get a little color around there. I'm going to blend this little bit out a little. And we're going to do the same thing on underneath his hat. I want to get that a little stronger up there so that it creates a nice shadow. Just like that. And I'm going to pull that blue all along his chin area. So it keeps the center portion of his face nice and bright, right in here. We want that nice bright white in the center of his face. And then we're going to take a little bit more and walk that out just a little. I'm not putzing too much, I'm just layering color in. <laughs> We're scrolling through looking for another question. Somebody had another question. Yes, this if you're wondering about what the surface is called, it is the rounded arch plaque.
I love this surface. I've used it a number of times. Um, this is also in the uh, sunflowers. Actually, this hangs up very nicely. Um, one of the girls asked how we hang it up. It's an eighth of an inch thick. So it's actually, and it's quite stiff. It doesn't sag in the middles. And it has these two wonderful little holes in it. Now myself, I will probably use a little bit of jute to hang him up or maybe even a little bit of um, baker's twine. I, I just think he's cute and it'll be cute hanging on a front door. You could um, string ribbon through it and hang it that way. And it does, they do hang very nicely. I've used this one for a variety of things. Yes, uh, Janet Benoit, yes, you can use the Pebeo transparents. It would work very well. Uh, if you're familiar with, with working with the Pebeo transparents, as long as you have that nice base, absolutely go right ahead and use those Pebeos. They're fabulous. Don't be shy, ladies. If you have a question, pop it up there. I have a little help in the studio today. My son will locate your question and make sure that I get it answered. So he is taking shape quite nicely. I'm going to pull a little of that um, cobalt teal here into his shoulders so that we get some shading there. He is taking shape rather nicely. I'm going to pop a little more of that cobalt in there. So every layer of this that I put on, the, the shadows get a little bit deeper and a little bit darker. So that level of control is nice to have when you're doing this. We are getting there nicely. So I'm about to break out my favorite color, and you know which one that is. So the Oishfaltum is going to go over some of this. Oopsie, I didn't wait for the paint to dry and now I'm taking paint off. I'm gonna break out a mop brush here. Oh, there's a brush I don't use very often. There's a mop. Um, I'm gonna use a pointed blender for this. I'm just going to tap this out because I did not let the paint dry and I ended up oversaturating the surface and so it pulled paint off. And, and we've all done that where we paint a little impatient and then we end up taking more paint off than we put on. I'm just using a point blender just to soften that a little to get rid of that hard edge that I built up because of it. And that was just me being impatient, which I frequently am. <laughs> I'm always in a bit of a hurry to get things done. So I'm gonna give that a second to dry. And while I have you, we'll talk about this IPC brush. This is an IPC point blender. This one is the large point. I do have a smaller one. Here we go. This one's the medium. Um, this is a neat brush. I had taken the photo for Dynasty and it, it had these two brushes in the foreground. Um, I'll, and I'll explain to you why. These brushes are ideal for floating. I know it sounds crazy, but they are. Um, so you just get the brush wet and then tip it into the paint so that you just have a small quantity just on the tip of the brush and then you just pat it out on the palette and then you can literally float with it. You can lay color into little tight spots with that brush. It's a really handy. Very handy. Okay, so I know somebody somebody had question about it earlier, why it was there. That's why, because you can use it for so many different things. But it's ideal for fixing little goof-ups like the one I just made. So I think, no, that's still wet. Hang on a second, I'm going to make some noise. Pardon me? Okay. <laughs> See, the technical, the technician in the room is the one that's helping me scroll. Somebody had a question here. I'm trying to find it. 
<laughs> Regina, you just don't. Okay, I already covered that. Can't find the medium anywhere in my area. Can we use a medium with regular? Um, there's a number of things that you can use with the fluid acrylics or with regular acrylic to make them more transparent. Uh, I like using the Josonia's fast drying glaze. If you can't find that, even just water will work beautifully. And uh, yeah. Oh, what else? Uh, don't you think they should rename a fault in the Tracy Pro? <laughs> I don't think that Stan Clifford would go for that, but uh, we'll run it by him. <laughs> it is my favorite color. I use it in everything. It's my favorite toning color. Okay, so I think our little guy is ready to really start uh, some serious shading. And you guessed it, I'm going to be using a little fluid acrylic or uh, a little asphaltum for that. I'm going to start with his face. So I'm turning him around and I've weakened my asphaltum. I thin it out quite a bit. And remember what I said about the asphaltum kind of gives it a greenish cast. You can really see that here that it really changes that bright blue to a little bit of a green and gives it a soft tone. It mutes it and warms it up so it doesn't look quite so cold. And I do the same thing wherever the cobalt teal is in this piece. A little float of it. It's heavily thinned. I don't use it full strength. I make sure that it's heavily thinned. Because you don't want this full strength. It would make things look dirty and a little too dark. But that little bit of asphaltum just warms up our little snowman a little bit. I love using asphaltum with the cobalt teal hue, particularly on white, because it keeps that whole cutter color palette from getting a little too chilly. And you can see his face is taking shape really nicely. And I'm going to put a little of that in there. Usually one layer is sufficient. It's just enough to give it a little age. And it softens it drastically so those colors aren't quite so cold. Easy peasy. So our little guy is coming together quite nicely here. Oh, the brush that I just showed is that this is the one you were asking about, Joni. This one is the Point Blender. These are IPC Point Blenders. They are available at the Brush Guys. Um, and if you're going to, if you're ordering brushes on the Brush Guys website, use the coupon code Tracy M. So it will give you a nice little extra discount on their website. So you'll get a little extra bonus. Uh, but these are IPC point blenders by Dynasty. Now the IP and C stand for ink, pastel and chalk, but they also work beautifully with your acrylics. There's a variety of different styles, but I absolutely love the point blenders. So if you're in, working in very tight little areas, whatnot, it's fabulous for working and washing color out. They're also fabulous for what we're gonna do next. So I have a little bit of primary magenta, just a little bit. You only need a dot of color because this is the only place that we're using it and it's only a tiny amount. So I've picked up a little bit on the tip of my my blender and I've sort of pounced it on my palette and now I'm going to pounce it on paper towel to take off the excess so we're gonna give this guy a nice little rosy glow to his cheeks and we're going to do that with a point blender you can do this with um, any one of your blenders really 
can even do it with a deer foot if you want to or a dry brush uh, but I like this point blender it's nice and soft and you can control the color easily so we're just going to give him a rosy cheek right there and I'm going to do the same thing here and I'm going to give him a rosy glow over here and yeah I'm going to go right over his his nose. And we're going to do something else with his nose. So all of that little texture that you put in that background, um, this is where it comes in handy because it picks up all the color for his cheeks. There we go. Because that primary magenta is such a strong red, I'm being very careful with it. So we want to put a little bit of a rosy glow in his cheeks. And again, a little bit of rubbing alcohol will take that excess color out without wetting your brush. And then your brush will be ready, dry and ready to use again really quickly. So there we have our rosy cheeks. So let's do something about his nose. I'm going to use that Eschfaltum again. And we're going to put a float along the bottom of his nose. And it can be fairly strong in this case because we want a little dimension. And the Ishvaltum works really, really well over orange. So I've got a nice little float there. <laughs> yes, Daisy, you should move to Canada. It's beautiful up here in the summertime. A little chilly in the winter. Um, somebody had a question here. What did I call the brush? Oh, the blending brush. The Point Blender. This is an IPC Point Blender. And most of these blenders come in three sizes. There is a small, a large, medium, and a small. So our little guy is really coming along. So now we've got a shadow across the bottom of his nose. I'm going to take a little bit of warm white and I'm going to put just a float of it slightly away from the edge of, of the color. Do you see I've got a little tiny gap in there? I just want to put a little bit of white. It's a very weak float, but I want the brightest part about just a tiny space away from the edge of the nose. And I'm going to do the same thing with his eyes. Take a tiny weak float and I'm going to put it right there. It's just a half arch. It starts about the top middle of the eye and comes down the left side. Like so. This is where he starts to take really take shape. And because we're going to take my favorite liner brush. Oh, I guess it's not a liner brush. <laughs> I grabbed what I thought was a liner. This is a zero rigger. And I'm going to take a little dot of warm white. And right about there. Now our little guy looks a little more lifelike. So now we have a pom-pom up here that we need to talk about. Now I took a little of the uh, primary cyan and I just filled in the pom-pom a little bit because the area that I was painting on wasn't quite dark enough. So I filled that in a little and I'm going to take a, I've got a, this is a 3 8 angle and it's a scruffy angle. It's not a real, it doesn't have a sharp edge anymore. Um, it's not the prettiest brush, but this is the one I'm going to use and I'm going to pick up a little bit of the warm white just on the toe of the brush and I'm going to work it into the brush as if I'm going to float but not neatly <laughs> so I'm going to stand this brush on its chisel edge and I'm going to do this it's a tap and pull like that I 
I'm sorry, I sound really stuffy. So a tap and pull, and it just creates a little texture for that pom-pom. And I wanted that darker background so that it, this pom-pom uh, has a little bit more oomph. So we'll just tap it in like this. let that uh, dry for a couple minutes and then you can repeat that so that you get layers so that each layer is a little brighter and a little stronger you can get a little chunky with that paint too don't be shy it does not hurt to have little gobs of paint on there press the brush a little harder and you get more textures just like that so that's what we're looking for. So we're just making this little puff ball look a little puffier. So there we have it. Now, I want to soften this area in here and soften these areas and just in general make him look a little fluffier. And I'm going to do that with the Mezzaluna. This is uh, the dry brush. It's my favorite dry brush. I like this one. I also like the size of it. So to dry brush, I pick up some warm white, pat it into the brush on the palette, and then again, I pat it on the paper towel just to take off any excess. I don't want it to be gobs and gobs of paint. And then I'm just going to lightly dry brush a highlight onto the front of his hat. I'm only going to come about two thirds of the way and leave a small gap on either edge where there's no white. I'm going to do the same at the top until you run out of paint, and then you do it again. There we go. This just softens the look of his hat a little bit, and I'm going to do the same thing on his scarf. Down here. And again, I'm only going to cover about two thirds. I don't want to cover everywhere, but it does need a little softening down here. So, just like that. Reload. And a couple. Oopsie. Oopsie. A little too much, but that's okay. We'll make it work. I'll do the same thing here. Um, would you buy a separate brush? Yes, absolutely. If you're using IPC blenders and point blenders um, with chalks, uh, with pan pastel and things like that, ideally you should never mix the two media together. So the, the perfect in a perfect world, I would absolutely suggest that you have a second set for acrylic. And another set if you're working with oils. There we go. Now, oops, we had a little accident here. I knocked over a bottle of fluid acrylic that landed in my white paint. <laughs> so I'm going to take that um, dry brush and I'm going to take that warm white and just up that highlight on the bridge of his nose. Um, if it's not getting any brighter, then switch over to some titanium white. But I just realized that it was, the bridge of his nose was looking a little scruffy, so I'm going to brighten that a bit. You can do the same thing to the top of his nose, add a little bit of white, just to give it a frosty look. And in general, using that dry brush of the white just softens the overall look because we're working with a lot of whites anyway and light blues having a little bit of that dry brushed white just softens the overall appearance of everything how fun such a cute little guy okay so we have his hats done we could probably bump up a few shadows if we wanted to um, you know, put another float of Ishvaltam in, or you could even take one of the darker blues if you really felt the need to. But I'm one of the things I like to do 
I like this sort of sketchy line around things. It defines this little guy without making him look too hard edged. And that sketchy line keeps him looking soft. It lends that sort of fluffy appearance to things. Just like that. Uh, what was the name of the brush I used? Oh, this is the Mezzaluna. This is a Dini Mezzaluna. These are very similar to the Crescent brush. You remember a low Cornell had a, a Crescent blender for dry brushing. This is the Mezzaluna. It's a, a actually a blend of synthetic and natural hair. These are a really great little brush. I've literally used them so much I wore one out. And that takes some doing because these things are pretty tough. But um, I did wear one out. Um, I've only had two sets since they made these, but I have literally worn out a set. Um, these are fantastic. You'll love this hair. It, you can't kill it. I wore it down to the point where <laughs> there's hardly any hair left in it. Um, but I was using it on all sorts of crazy things and I used it daily. It lasted me about three years before I finally killed it. So, a little dry brushing. So here's that funky pen that I use, this black gel. Um, I use this thing a lot. I use it for my line work, I use it in my design work, I use it for transferring patterns, and I also use it for detailing things. It is a Japanese ink, so it's very, very black and an ultra fine point. It's a 0.38, so it's very, very fine. And it has a stainless steel ball instead of a Teflon ball. So it doesn't get snarled and snagged up and clogged by the acrylic, which I love that I can draw right over top of my acrylic paint with this. And I like adding these little details, these little sketchy lines everywhere. It just lends something new to it. And you can write with it. I mean, they, they work beautifully. Make sure when you do this that before you would apply a brush on varnish that it sits for a good 24 hours. Don't try to varnish over it before it's completely dry and cured because you'll just end up smearing it. Um, but I have literally used a heat gun to set this, this ink, and then um, spray varnish it inside of 10 minutes. So if you're going to use a brush on, make sure it's good and dry before you do that but if you're going to set it with uh, spray burnish um, you're good after about 10 minutes just make sure it's dry before you do it so i'm going to put a few little sketchy lines around his nose and you can do the same thing to that pom-pom remember you can put some sketchy little details in i like working with this stuff is really nice and it works so well over top of acrylic and that gorgeous stainless steel ball doesn't snag on everything or get gummed up. Look how cute he is. Why are you not smiling? You see a little snowman. Fun. You can tell he's he was not difficult to paint. If you have the basics, you can do this. He's really fun and stinking cute. So there, we've got all of our little details in, little sketchy lines are in. Our little snowman is just about done. So the next thing we have to focus on is the lettering over here. And as you know, almost everything that I paint has got lettering in it. Um, because one, I like lettering and I like to have the chance to do it whenever possible so it goes in so snow day really pretty font just a really pretty font for this and I'm working with today I've got a zero rigger because this lettering is quite narrow so let's talk about the rigger um, I know I repeat myself a lot about this but some of the some of you joining me just haven't seen this. A number two rigger, or in this case a zero rigger, it looks like a liner but it's actually built like a flat brush. 
So when I push on it, you can see it did not have a rounded edge. It has a square edge, like a flat. So when I push down on this to fill in lettering, when you apply pressure to it, I can paint up to a quarter of an inch in width using a zero. So that skinny little brush will paint lettering that is up to a quarter inch wide. And because of the length of this brush, I can pull it quite a ways before it starts to run out of paint. So it has a nice full belly. It will hold a, quite a bit of paint. So when you tap down, it forms a chisel edge. So that chisel edge will do nice fine edges. And then when you press down to open it up and then lift up, press down, lift up, it will come back up onto that chisel edge and you can do those fine lines coming off the lettering. This is why I use a breaker. So, coming back to our little snow day guy. Two things. Don't worry about getting the lettering perfectly opaque. It doesn't matter. You just need to make sure that they are straight and clean. So I'm going to start, load this up, chisel edge. I've flattened my brush on the palette so that I have a chisel edge. So I have a nice sharp edge. I press down to open the brush up till it fills the space and then release the brush till it comes back up onto the chisel edge. And that will give you that great lettering. Press down to open the brush up, release to bring it up onto the chisel edge. Press down, open it up, release to bring it up on the chisel edge. It takes a little bit of practice, but I promise you if you have the right tool for the job, you will be able to do it well. And my two favorite brushes in the Faux Squirrel line are the number two Faux Squirrel Rigger or the Zero. With those two brushes, you can paint almost any size lettering that you would use in this type of project. And you can do it quite well and quite easily. The brush is easy to control because it is not super long and it's not super short. So you'll be able to bang out this lettering no problem at all. Now, there, aside from just painting the lettering, there is no special um, shading or anything like that to do on this lettering. It is just the plain white lettering on that dark blue background. And with a little practice, you can do this in one pull. You learn how to get your paint just so. You get it the right thickness or the right consistency. You'll be able to blow this lettering out in no time. Travel to study with artists. <laughs> I would love to. I'm looking forward to traveling again. Yeah. Oh, Marianne. You can't travel anymore. Oh my goodness. None of us can travel right now. So yes, I know exactly what you mean. I'm love I'm enjoying doing this. This is a lot of fun. So we've got day painted. That zero and that number two rigger will let you paint lettering so easily. You will find that having that right brush and a little bit of practice, your lettering is going to improve drastically. Especially when you trace and transfer it well. If you've got nice clean transfer, you know, those vertical and horizontal lines are nice and straight. 
you're going to have great looking lettering. Oopsie. I just whoopsied something here. There we go. The nice part about working uh, with lettering is that if you find that you make a mistake with this thinned paint, keep a little baby uh, wipe or uh, you know a shop towel moist with water handy. And if you whoopsie, just wipe it off and try it again. It's just paint. So again, press down, open the brush up, get it up on the chisel edge. Don't worry about getting them fully opaque. At this point, it doesn't matter. That bright white against that blue background is going to stand out regardless. And remember what I said about the shading? It was going to look a little strong until we get the lettering on there. Once that white is on, the lettering really pops and then the shadow is set back a little. And it looks really nice. Look at that. Our lettering is done. All right, see, and I whoopsied right here. It wasn't quite dry, and I stuck my finger in it. There we go. Having that, that little rigor makes a world of difference. And don't forget, one of the giveaways this week, there's two of these in that brush set. So if you don't have one, make sure that you like and then share this video. Um, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on my YouTube channel either. You'll be able to see a lot more videos that we've got coming up so that aren't part of the lives. So I'm just going to give this W was looking a little peaky there. So a quick recoat. And there we go. Her lettering is done. So now we've got a couple more steps yet to go. Um, of course, I have to spatter everything under the sun. So this little devil, this is a great little spatter brush. This is part of the IPC line too. This is the medium angled fan. I know it's different looking, but it's a great little spatter brush. Pick up a little bit of warm white. And I'm going to use my favorite technique and that is just you know the old toothbrush technique works really well for me. Thin that out. I'm going to spatter this just with some thinned warm white because I like that. It softens everything nicely. And it looks like snow. <laughs> so we got a little spatter on there. Now we're going to talk about the edges of this piece. Now in this original, I used um, a chippy wood or chip paint technique. Uh, Chris Hoy showed me how to do this. I just, I think it's marvelous. I love how it finishes things. And so I've used sort of this chipped paint technique on the edge. But there's another way we can finish this that, that works quick and it gives it a nice look. And that's with a stamp pad. Now, the stamp pad method is really fun. You just need to stay on stamp pad and you're going to rub the edges like this. Now, if the stamp pad is at a higher angle, you're going to get less. If you lay it out, you get a bit more. So you can age corners really nicely with this. This is a fun method of antiquing and aging the edges of this thing is rubbing it with the stamp pad. Now the chipped paint technique is a little bit different and I'm going to show you how to do that too. So you need a little bit of carbon black or lamp black on your palette and you need a round brush or a rigger and you just pick up a little bit of black paint and you just drag it along the edge like this 
you can roll it or drag it but it needs to look a little irregular and imperfect and it will create little pockets along the edges and in the corners now you can do this by pushing and pulling the brush or you can roll it like so and again neatness doesn't count with this one you can just it creates some really interesting patterns just by happenstance so and I like this look too this is a fun look so just roll it along all the way around the outside edge of your piece even along the bottom of the snowman like so it just I'm, I believe in putting in these little things it finishes things nicely it finishes them in a creative way and it lends a lot more character to the piece when you use various techniques for edging things. It just makes them more unique. What line of brushes do the rigger come in? I couldn't find them on the brush guys. You need to look under uh, Dynasty Faux Squirrel, F-A-U-X Squirrel. You look under there and you will find it. They do carry the full line of the faux squirrel too, so if you're looking for other things, angles or filberts or whatnot, they have them all there. But the, all of the riggers are there, or, as are the, uh, the angles that I use. Do I do two coats on my lettering? Generally, no, unless I find them a little too thin. Um, generally, I only do one. The reason being is that most of the time, if you try to do two coats, you, you never get as clean a finish as if you get with just one. Uh, Belinda Hirschman, the brush I'm using is a number two or a number zero rigger. That's what I use for doing my lettering. And they're available from the brush guys at uh, thebrushguys.com. Don't forget to use that coupon code with Tracy M. It'll give you a little extra discount on your purchase. <laughs> Kathleen, I would love to come down and, and um, teach a class from one of the chapters down there. I'm really looking forward to all of the restrictions being lifted, as I'm sure everybody is. So, when it's safe for everybody to do it again, absolutely. Okay, I'm almost done with that edge. There we go. So I've got the chippy paint look all the way around. And we're going to pop that a little bit. I'm going to use that same rigger or a liner brush. And a little bit of thinned warm white. Let me turn this guy around here. And this just pops that sort of chippy paint look. I use a very fine irregular line and just sort of trace that pattern that you just created. It can be hit and miss. It doesn't have to be in you know, one solid line. It can be broken up. It can be irregular. But it does enhance that sort of broken paint look around the edge. So you just go all the way around the edge with that little bit of that little fine line, just like so. Again, neatness doesn't count. Don't worry about being you know, nailing it perfectly everywhere. As long as it's, you know, remotely close, where it's good. So you go all the way around your piece with that rigger and, and highlight that, that chipped paint edge. We've only got a couple more things left to do. One of them involves gesso and a little bit of glitter, because you can't have a snowman without glitter. So, and I just realized I don't have any glitter on my paint table. <laughs> and I get my technical assistant here to uh, go to my paint cabinet and um, up on the top shelf, it should say glamour dust. <laughs> it's 
got a gold lid. He's looking, but he doesn't know what he's looking for, so. It's just gonna be a white powdery substance that sparkles. He's looking. <laughs> okay, I think I'm gonna have to grab it. Hang on, gang, just one sec. I got glitter. Glamour dust. That's my favorite glitter because it's so subtle. So I'm just going to quickly finish off this uh, fine line around the edges. Like so. Da -da -da -da. I don't like quiet areas. There we go. So that little highlight. Um, does wonders for this sort of chippy paint look. It just highlights the edge of it and just creates a little more visual texture in this piece. And it's snow. It's got to be fun. Now we need to give it one more layer of depth. And I really wanted that to pop forward. So we're going to use a little bit of white gesso and a palette knife. So I have some white gesso. This is the media gesso, but any brand will work fine. Um, I like this one because it's quite thick, but any brand of gesso will work just fine. A texture medium will work fine. Uh, there is even a clear one that will work fine too. So I'm going to position, I'm going to choose my stencils first, or snowflakes first. I really like this one. This one's very leafy and very pretty. Um, so I'm going to apply three or four. So I'm going to use this snowflake here and this one. And I like to overlap the images slightly. The reason being is that by overlapping this image, it brings these things forward even further, visually. It gives you the impression that he is actually behind it. And because it's got all that shading back there, it's going to make this snowflake look really bright. So I'm going to put a very thin layer of gesso over top of that snowflake. And then I'm going to carefully pull it off. So I have one dimensional snowflake. Um, somebody asked where else they could get the rigger. So if the brush guys are out of stock, or if you're on the East Coast, then you want to go to MaureenBaker.com. So it's Maureen-Baker.com. She has a full line of the faux squirrel as well, and she'll have the riggers. So I've got one on there, and I think we need one down here. I'm losing my voice, gang. <laughs> I'm sorry if I sound like gravel gurney. It's just allergies. I'm fine. So I'm going to put a little bit of that gesso here. And I carefully pull that away. I managed to goof that up a little bit, but that's okay. And then I've got this really pretty, this other pretty snowflake here. I'm going to get a couple more in here. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm thinking right here would be a good spot for that. Now you can tell I'm not using a ton of gesso and you should be able to see the image right through the gesso. Look at that. And let's pull one right here. Oops. I'm trying to avoid getting it in the other snowflake, but I failed miserably. So I'm going to put one right here. A little bit of gesso right over top of that snowflake. Just like that. And now I'm going to carefully remove the stencil. So now we have one, two, three, four, five snowflakes on here. And while the gesso is still wet, 
this is the perfect opportunity to put in some glitter. So I'm going to take that glamour dust and sprinkle it right into that wet gesso. Just like that. to do this while it's wet but it's just too finicky to try and put it in put glitter on a dry surface so I'm going to grab a piece of paper just like this so and I like to tap the surface a little bit and then stand it up tap to remove the excess glitter and that way I can just pour this back into the bottle because that's a lot of glitter and that is our snow day snowman he was very fun to paint I'm just going to collect up this glitter and put it away now before the cat walks through it and I have to clean up glitter for the rest of the week month year because glitter is forever you spill any and you're going to be finding glitter into the next century. Oops. Okay, so what we did today, and we've done quite a bit. We started with a black base, base coat. We put in some vertical stria using white paint. We used stamps, that Stampendous uh, Snowflake Sky, uh, to put in a little background texture and a background interest. We stenciled with polka dots. Then we added color, all of those gorgeous blues. Then we stenciled some more, building up another layer with the larger polka dots and the smaller polka dots. And then we added snowflakes just to give that a little more depth and a little more texture. Then we painted our snowman and stenciled his hat, his scarf. We painted his face, we added some detail. Then we painted lettering and now we finished off with this fun, chipped paint technique on the edges and then some dimensional snowflakes with glitter. So we have put a lot into a very short period of time. So we're ready to go back up. We have finished painting our snowman. I'm going to switch the camera around. Hi guys. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. It was a lot of fun. A uh, couple of things to cover. We have some great giveaways. Uh, for this week. Don't forget to like and share the video. Um, don't forget to comment or ask a question. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. If I've missed any, I will go back and have a look and try to answer them to my best of my ability. Um, the giveaways this week, we have a gorgeous set of the Dynasty Faux Squirrel brushes. Uh, we have two sets of the uh, Snow Day stencil set that we used to do this little guy. And so uh, we also have that Craftgasm t-shirt. <laughs> I love this. I have that sign hanging in my studio. And so uh, I think you'll get a kick out of it. So one of you is going to win the Craftgasm t-shirt. So uh, don't forget, hit the like button, share the video, please. Please, please, please share the video. Um, go to my YouTube channel and subscribe so that you can see all of the new videos that we've got coming up and some new live classes that will be going up as well. And uh, what else? Am I forgetting anything? Probably. <laughs> uh, but I won't forget this. Guys, I really appreciate you coming and joining me and spending your time with me on Saturdays. I have a blast doing it, and I hope you're enjoying it too. And I now remembered what it is I forgot. Next week, we're going to be doing a piece called Love Potion. And uh, somebody had asked for a skull, so we're gonna paint some skulls next week. The project is called Love Potion Pattern and will be up on the website tomorrow. So that's it for today. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Love y'all. Have a great weekend and we'll see you again soon.